heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 337, covering the week of December 12th through December 16th, 2022. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab and our Facebook pages, and subscribe to our YouTube page. The YouTube page, of course, is an invaluable resource because it's got all of our podcasts, all of our lectures that we've videoed over the years, uh, all of our Abbeville U videos. It's going to have our 1607 project material. There's just a tremendous amount of stuff up there, so you're going to want to subscribe to the YouTube channel. It is all free of charge, and it is great material. You've got fantastic lectures by academics. You've got, again, these short Abbeville U videos on very important topics. You've got all the podcasts. So much good stuff there, all free of charge. So is our website, though, which has nearly 3,000, 3,000 articles on it. And you, it. It's an amazing virtual library of Southern materials. So all of that stuff is free of charge to you, only because of your generous contribution. So if you like all these things, the podcast, the website, the lectures, the conferences, the Zoom webinars, consider that tax-deductible donation to the Abbeville Institute. It is the end of the year. Many of you have gotten our newsletter. If you haven't gotten it in person, maybe you got it through the email. I did send it out in an email. So you see what we've done over the past year. We, we're going to have an even bigger 2023. I can almost guarantee it. We've got so much good stuff in the works and planning. It's just going to be a great 2023 for the Institute. So Please consider that donation. Uh, it's essential for us to ensure that we can continue to do our mission here and our good work at the Institute. Uh, also, go to abbevilleinstitute.org, click on the uh, shop tab. You can get our logo on all kinds of interesting material for Christmas. So if you were looking for that last minute Christmas gift, you can order that material. I don't know if you can get it in time. We are getting up against the, the end here. We've only got about a week to Christmas. so. Maybe you can't, but maybe it's that post-Christmas gift that you've got. So consider that that uh, Abbey Institute fan in your life. Uh, and as always, share material around on social media. Uh, rate the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Rate, review, and subscribe. Review it at Apple Podcasts. Leave that text review. Also, leave a comment on the YouTube videos. Do all you can to get people seeing our material and listening to our material and doing what we can to help change the narrative in America. And... This is the last podcast of 2022, and so I want to talk for a few minutes about that and then talk about 2023 for a minute and then lead into the material for the week, the last uh, new podcast of the year. We do have over 300 episodes, so if you're looking for something to listen to while you're uh, sitting around, there's no Abbeville podcast once a week for the next couple of weeks. You can go back and grab those old podcasts. I mean, there's 300 of them. So 336 prior to this one. And of course, if you have a mobile app, you can get them that way. You can get them on YouTube. You can get them through SoundCloud or Anchor. You can go out and get those things, Spotify. So those are, are great ways to, uh, to get the old material. Uh, also, we've got the Abbeville Academy. Let me mention that. If you like those Zoom webinars, um, you can get that Abbeville Academy material. Uh, on uh, it's just abbevilleacademy.org and you can purchase those old webinars. We just had one last night on uh, Confederate monuments. Great webinar, um, fantastic response. That one was free of charge, and we're trying that to see how that would work out. We do have to pay for the Abbeville Academy to host that. We have to pay for the Zoom material, so that's why we do charge for some of these. We charge at the Abbeville Academy for these things. They do cost us money every year, so. We can't offer all of that free of charge all the time, but this one was a tremendous response. Great webinar. Uh, we thank uh, Mr. Lee for coming out and doing that webinar for us. Just a, a fantastic time, and good to see a lot of you all out there. But uh, all that said, let's talk about 2022 for a minute. You know, 2022 has been a pretty tough year. A lot of things happening in 2022. The most egregious, of course, was the Naming Commission and their recommendations to get rid of all Confederate imagery across the United States military, including the Reconciliation Monument at Arlington Cemetery. We'll see if that actually comes down or not. There's been a lot of pushback, at least in some areas, against it. I don't think that Congress is really interested in doing much about it. They haven't made a word. 
Haven't said a word about it. Haven't made a peep about this. But we've had some tough issues in 2022. There's no doubt about it. And it seems like the other side is always winning. I mean, they're, they're, it's like they're just rolling victory after victory. But um, on the other hand, I think there are some positive developments. I mean, they have power in areas that we don't. On the, but contra on the contrary, I think that we're making, uh, you know, we're, we're getting popular opinion moving in our direction in some ways. Uh, it's a slow process. I've said it before. It's like climbing Mount Everest with flip-flops and shorts and a t-shirt. It's a difficult process and one that uh, is not going to be easy to do. But that said, I think that it can be done. And um, this podcast and the website and the things we do are contributing to changing the narrative or at least reinforcing normalcy in America. And that's one thing that I think we need to emphasize, it's normal to think the South is a unique and important part of American history and an important contributor to American society and not just for all the negative things. It was normal to think the South was a beautiful place. And I was uh, in a thrift store the other day and I was going through old postcards. Uh, I like to collect old postcards, linen postcards, because you get to see normal America. And a lot of these Postcards, if they've been sent, of course, to somebody else and somebody just gets the postcard, you can see who sent it, where they sent it to. And I was I was looking through some that came out of Georgia. And it's fascinating. All the people that are sending postcards back to New England or New York from Georgia in the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, and talking about how beautiful it was in the South and how wonderful it was down here. And it's scenes of flowers and beautiful homes and uh, beach scenes and rivers and all this stuff that all these natural beauty, the natural beauty of the South, that people across the United States came to the South. Tourism was a big industry and people wanted to see it. And some of it, of course, is Confederate iconography. They wanted to see antebellum Southern homes. They wanted to see Confederate statues. They wanted to see things that were unique to that people in that section. And now what the woke cancel culture people are trying to do, which of course Charles Sumner and others was trying to do in the 1850s, is bulldoze Southern, uh, Southern uh, imagery from the vision of America. They're trying to get rid of all of it. It's just to eliminate it. It's, to, it's cultural Marxism. We must eliminate anything we don't agree with, anything that makes us feel inferior or hurts our feelings or for whatever stupid reason that would be. But we have to bulldoze all this stuff and get rid of it. And uh, I find it fascinating when you go back and look at normal America. People thought this stuff was interesting. and They, they wanted to go see it. It was something unique and interesting in society. And so um, th that is... I think the thing that is most most important about what we do is to ensure that all these things that are there still have a voice in modern American society at this podcast and on our website. But the South is the Southern tradition, Southern culture is normal, and it's a beautiful thing to be proud of to have in that tradition. So over the last year, we've produced... Uh, nearly a dozen Zoom webinars, all of which are available uh, on the Abbeville Academy website um, if you want to pick them up there. Great, great webinars on a host of topics. I mean, we've had a lot of cool stuff this year, things like Southern Literature, and Abraham Lincoln, and uh, you know, Robert E. Lee. We had the just had the webinar on Confederate uh, monuments. Just a tremendous amount of material this year. And all of that was a smashing success because of you. I mean, you did, you contributed to that. You came to those webinars, you participated, you let people know about it, and it was a grand time. We also had a very good summer school this year at the Abbeville Institute on the Southern tradition. Um, it is, um, you know, they're, they're always a good time. We are going to be thinking about how we're going to restructure those for the future, and we're going to focus more on students for the quote-unquote summer school and have conferences for donors. Um, so those are going to be things that we're thinking about, you know, how we can adjust this. We really want students, if you're a student, you're listening to this podcast, if you're an undergraduate, graduate student, or even a high school student, and you listen to the podcast, we want you involved because you are important 
for the Southern tradition and Southern history moving forward and how those things are presented in the United States. And so we want to focus a lot on students and trying to get our students involved. We do have some very good students at the Institute, people that are graduate students, undergraduate students, and they email us and they're involved in things. So if you're that, if you're that, if you're interested in that, please, you know, get in touch with us. So let us know you'd like to participate in these kind of things. So uh, we are going to be doing more with students in the future, but we had a very good summer school. All of those lectures now have been, are being presented on the YouTube channel. We're, we're uh, inching them out. And so you can see what we did there. Um, we had, of course, you know, hundreds and hundreds of articles published on the website this past year. We did several of the Abbeville U videos, um, the most recent of which, of course, was on the Arlington Monument, uh, Arlington Confederate Monument. So uh, those are uh, uh, those are a vital part of our mission. Um, we are working on the 1607 project, and thankfully that has started to gain some momentum. We've got the website up for it. We've got the trailer made for it. We've got most of the material for the book that's going to be produced in now, and so we're working on that. That will be released in 2023, so that's been going on behind the scenes. We're going to see some changes to our website in 2023, I think just a little tweak on some things. We're going to see some conferences. We've got our very wonderful 20th anniversary conference coming up in April, April 13th through 16th, 2023 at Callaway Gardens in beautiful Pine Mountain, Georgia. It's going to be a wonderful time. We have a lot of great speakers lined up for that. You only have till March to get your hotel room. So once we get to the first year, there's going to be a pretty strong blitz to get you to register for that and pick up your hotel rooms and come on out to that. It is a three-day event. The conference fee that we're charging covers your meals, your lunch, dinner, and, and snacks throughout the day and drinks, beverages for the three days along with the conference fee. You do have to pay for your hotel on the side. Uh, but that, that conference fee does cover all of that. It is a resort. This is not a place that you just go. It's kind of a hotel in an urban jungle. This is a beautiful resort in April at Pine Mountain, Georgia, Callaway Gardens. There's no more beautiful time of the year. The azaleas are popping. It is a wonderful place to be. There's actually a place called the uh, Callaway Brothers Azalea Bowl. It is one of the most beautiful places you will ever see in the South in the springtime. You definitely want to be there. Um, they have uh, the resort itself, you know, lakes. Uh, you can bike. They have you know miles and miles of bike trails, walking trails. There's a great birds of prey show that they do uh, twice a day. It's a fantastic experience, and we will spend some time in the gardens. Um, you also have uh, other parts, very beautiful parts of the gardens besides the azalea bowl. There's a butterfly garden, which is, I mean, one of the most beautiful things you'd ever see in your life. It's a tropical environment with hundreds and hundreds of butterflies fl uh, flitting around in this garden while you walk in it. I mean, it's amazing. Um, so just a, a beautiful, peaceful environment and a nice place to reflect on the Southern tradition and what that means. That's coming up in 2023. Of course, we're still going to be doing our articles. We're still going to be doing our Zoom uh, webinars. We've got one we're planning for January that I think you're really going to want to get involved in. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff happening at the Abbeville Institute. And we appreciate all your support. Your contributions make all that possible every single year we do this. Uh, all this stuff costs money, whether it's just people behind the scenes putting this stuff there and doing it, uh, whether it's the programs that we do, the facilities we have to rent, all these things. They all cost money to do, and that's why we do ask for donations. I wish it was all free and we could just do it free of charge, but nothing is free. Uh, even you know our app and all these things, your mobile app, which you can download, um, that costs us money. The Abbeville Academy costs us money. Internet work costs us money. All this stuff costs money. And then the labor to do all these things also is part of that. So if you anybody that's been involved in a nonprofit knows it's not really nonprofit. There's a lot that goes on. And so you, though, you're the ones that drive that. And we appreciate all your support. I mean that. Um, we can't do this without you. And all the kind words that you've given. Of course, this year we had the transition from Don Livingston retiring as president. We'll talk about that in April 2023. And he's going to give a reflection on the Institute We've got a fantastic video we're producing on that as well. 20 years of reflection at the Institute. Um, so all of that stuff that we do, and of course me taking over as president of the organization, um, it's been some growing pains. I mean, there's some things that 
you know, we're trying to get everything worked out. And I know that um, there's been some disconnect and uh, and some things that we were trying to keep continuity there. And it's been there's been a challenge in trying to get all that to work uh, because Don ran this for 20 years. And, um, you know, so that that does create, you know, things are done this way. And so we have all that going on behind the scenes. But I do appreciate your kind words, and we're trying to get it all, and I think 2023, it's really going to be smoothed out, and everything's going to be functioning the way it should moving forward. Uh, and uh, the Institute is still going to do the work that we've been doing for 20 years, and hopefully more and better. And that's what we want to do. We want to make this better, and a better experience for people interested in the Southern tradition. Young people in particular, we want you to love saying you're from the South. And I mean, I hope that's the case. And in this week, uh, we had some really interesting material on that. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, as I always do, I'll talk a little bit about it. The first piece is actually from a woman who's written for us a number of times, Julie Payne, uh, lives in uh, in the Dakotas and um, uh, or Idaho. Is it Idaho? I think it's Idaho. Anyways, she lives in the West, right? Not not in. Um, she lives in Idaho, excuse me. Not in, I don't know why I thought the code is, not in uh, the South, but she loves the Southern tradition. And this is why the tradition really is timeless. And I mean that. It's timeless and it's, it's, it's borderless. The tradition means something because people all over the world, and we get people all over the world listening to this podcast and all over the United States listening to this podcast and reading our material. We get it all the time. Hey, I'm, I'm writing you from, from Poland. I'm writing you from Greece. I'm writing you from Australia. I'm writing you from, you know, New York. I'm writing you from California. I'm writing you from this place. And they find the Institute. I'm writing you from Canada. And they say, wow, you know, I've never heard anybody go out and be positive about the American South because all you ever get is its race and slavery. And when you go and you listen to Don Livingston and say, well, what about the national normity of this? What about all the things that are involved in this? It's not just the South. I mean, all these things that are pointed at the South as the boogeyman in American society, you should be pointing your fingers at the entire United States. It's unfair and it's unjust. And not just that, it's inaccurate. It's ahistorical to do these things. But Julie Payne writes about how she wants to find Confederate ancestors. She doesn't have any, but that's okay, because the tradition is bigger than just Confederate ancestors. The history of the South is bigger than just four years of warfare. And a lot of people settled in the West who were from the South, who were looking to get away from Reconstruction or have some independence. And she writes about this in this little place in Idaho that she found, you know, Idaho City, and how it was actually founded by former Confederates. And it was, you know, they're very proud of this. Uh, it was a mining town. She titled the article, Sitting on a Gold Mine. Great, great title with that. And she has found the tradition. She's reading the literature and, and interested in Southerners throughout history. And why wouldn't you be, if you were just interested in American history, you should be. You should be interested in Washington and Jefferson and Madison and Monroe. You should be interested in John Marshall, even on the other side, John C. Calhoun, uh, David Crockett, the Alamo. You should be interested in all of these things, the settlement of the West, George Rogers Clark, Lewis and Clark, these are big figures in American history that don't need to be demonized, that don't need to be canceled. They need to be celebrated. We know that the monument to Lewis and Clark has been taken down in Virginia. It's stupid. It's abject stupidity and clown world that's leading to this stuff because these people are essential for our understanding of what America is and was. The people that are trying to take this down want America to be something entirely different. You look at the Leninists, and this is what they wanted to do. They had to restructure society and take away all the old heroes and replace them with something that they thought was much more palatable. And so people that come to the tradition, they find the Jeffersonian tradition, and they find this in the South, and they enjoy these things. This is great stuff, and I appreciate all the contributions from people. And again, Julie, I apologize for saying you're from the Dakotas. It was... Idaho, and I knew that for some reason. I just didn't. <laughs> it, I, I said Dakotas. I apologize for that. Um, but you have these people interested in the tradition outside of the South. We tend to think you know, only Southerners can enjoy the tradition. It's not true. It's not true at all. People all over the world can enjoy this tradition and learn from it. Clyde Wilson used to talk about the fact that he had people from Europe many times over come to see him about John C. Calhoun 
because they were interested in things like the concurrent majority, and they're interested in nullification. They're interested in some type of power-checking power. And not just checks and balances within its own government, but also outside power-checking power. And Calhoun is someone, as a great political philosopher, resonates with people around the world. He's not, I mean, not always right. Nobody's always right. But in terms of, uh, you know, republicanism, which uh, the piece on Tuesday about Jefferson and republicanism speaks to Calhoun as well. And the thing I like about this piece, and Holochak, uh, Mark Andrew Holochak is going to be writing essentially a weekly piece for us on Jefferson, some type of southern side of Jefferson, which is fantastic because we use Jefferson imagery a lot at the Institute. And he talks here about republicanism. And essentially, uh, republicanism, as he points out in this, is um, government through the people, through elected officials, and but he calls it thin government, meaning that it's, it's limited structured government of and by the people through elected officials. That's what he says. But that thin government is important because you have to have a virtuous, principled people. It's something Calhoun pointed out. And I like this piece because if you listen to my, my own personal podcast, The Brian McClanahan Show, yesterday, which was the last podcast for the year of that show, I talked about republicanism. And this piece fits nicely into that because Jefferson and, of course, John Taylor and others were talking about the corruption that came from non-Republican government. And he, uh, Holochak talks about federalism here, but non-Republican government and uh, how thin government. And he, he goes through Jefferson's uh, dichotomy of Northerners and Southerners later on in this piece um, and how Southerners, their concept of republicanism uh, would then have an impact on American government in society. Washington was a firm proponent of republicanism, and that meant sacrifice and duty, and again, as he says, thin governments. Thin governments. You have to have a limited authority, or you're going to get corruption and the worst kind of corruption. It's going to be a fusion of government and finance, or a fusion of government and industry, or, or just simply big corrupt government in one way or another. And so if you have virtuous people, virtuous people, then you will have good government. And you need that. Um, you need that virtuous side of it to ensure that, that good government exists. And so this is principle. He would think that the Federalists, as he, as he had the, the dichotomy there, the Federalists, would not be uh, interested in this kind of virtuous system. Jefferson thought that. You know, these are the stock jobbers, the paper jobbers, the people that are trying to you know, game the system, to get rich off the system. And so um, you know, this, this particular essay is very good to give insight into Jefferson and republicanism. And I do thank Dr. Holochak for writing these. Um, he has uh, graciously decided that he wants to do this on a regular basis, and um, he, we're going we're gonna to publish it. And so, uh, again, that's a nice call. If you have something that you think would be good, that you want to see your name and lights at the Abbeville Institute, then send us those articles. You know, we'd like to publish stuff from people who, who want to have their voice heard and contribute to the conversation about the Southern tradition and Southern culture and society. And then finally, uh, before we get into the stuff on Christmas, and I'll do that in a minute, kind of finish up the year with that, uh, we had a piece on John Singleton Mosby by uh, Valerie Protopappas. Now, there's no better modern voice on Mosby than Valerie Protopappas. She wrote a wonderful book on the man. She was at one time involved with uh, the Southern Cavalry Review, which is the journal of the John, of the Stuart Mosby Historical Society. And she knows a lot about the man. Now, what's fascinating about Mosby, and he's, he's like Longstreet in this way. Longstreet, 
You often hear the people that are saying, well, you lost callers don't like Longstreet because he became a Republican and he became a Republican and he supported Reconstruction. And uh, so you're not going to give him a statue and you're going to make stuff up about the guy. And people did that all the time. John Singleton Mosby became a Republican when the war was over. But what John Singleton Mosby did, which is fascinating, is after 30 years of being prodded and poked, and of course, being charged with treason and other things, he finally issued a statement about what he called war crimes in the South. And it's a heavy indictment of Northern military policy. Mosby, the Republican, Mosby, the man that supported some elements of Reconstruction when the war was over, was very critical of Northern treatment of Southern civilians during the war and Northern prosecution of the war. And she goes through in this piece and cites long sections of where Mosby was very critical of how the North conducted the war, particularly in places like the Shenandoah Valley. Now, if Southerners who were lost cause partisans just didn't like somebody who became a Republican, well, then nobody would have liked John Singleton Mosby. But they did. And even before Mosby wrote this, uh, they didn't have the same kind of feelings about Mosby as they did about Longstreet. Now, I think some of that has to do with military success and non-military success. But uh, Mosby was in the same position as Longstreet, essentially, when the war was over, as someone who supported the Republicans and you know, kind of switched sides, so to speak. But he was not condemn the way that Longstreet was. So all of this argument against, you know, uh, lost causers don't like Longstreet because he just don't, he just became a Republican. What about John Singleton Mosby? What about Mosby? Uh, Mosby would say things like slavery caused the war. I mean, and yet Mosby was still accepted by Southerners in the quote unquote lost cause mythology period than uh, in, in more in more cases than Longstreet. That's that tells you something about these dopes that are running around. They're they're cherry picking. They're his, I mean they're they're all uh, incestuous and syncophantic in that they just kind of clamor together and they just regurgitate whatever anybody else says. And you see this a lot with these people. They just cite their own stuff over and over again. Uh, they don't go outside of that. And they try to, and they cherry pick stuff that they think can really help themselves, and don't really talk about the entirety and the context of all these things. They don't look at American history in the long array. They look at it in a very short period, and so they're historically blind because they're ideologues, and that's important. Now, all of that said, and that actually has to do with you know northern telling of the tale and northern history, and this actually factors into Christmas too, and so. Last couple of pieces of the week, we had um, a couple of pieces dedicated to Christmas. And one of them was by yours truly, a Southern Christmas sampler. And I love music. Um, we had years ago the Southern Rock for the Apocalypse. We were doing you know, top rock songs. We never finished that series because a lot of people got busy and we just couldn't finish writing it out. It took some time to write out little paragraphs for each one of the songs we picked. We still have a lot of that left and maybe we'll revive that and you know, call it something else and kind of continue with the mission of that. But my family loves Christmas music. We put it on early as December 1st. Even before that, we're, we're playing it uh, in November. Uh, even before Thanksgiving, we're playing it. We're playing it early November. We're playing Christmas music. We love it. We love Christmas in our household. And a lot of the songs you get on traditional Christmas stations are going to be northern songs. It's going to be songs that are written in the north. You know, even you know Bing Crosby's White Christmas was written in New England because they weren't getting a white Christmas that year. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And so you know, this very New England slant to the way that media portrays Christmas. But Christmas really was a Southern holiday for a lot longer than it ever was a Northern holiday. In fact, we talked about that with Thanksgiving, how Southerners would celebrate Christmas and Northerners would celebrate Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving was viewed as somehow this Northern holiday and Christmas was kind of like a Southern holiday. We talked about how that was the case. 
but you still have this still you still have this very northern slant to music. Well, I went out and I thought it'd be fun to go pick you know a dozen songs or so that were written written by Southerners, not just performed by Southerners. You can find that all the time. You can find you know traditional Christmas hymns and a Christian Christmas hymns and other traditional Christmas songs performed by Southerners. That's not hard to find. But can you find some some unique Christmas songs written and performed by Southerners? And that's what I presented in this little piece of Southern Christmas Sampler. So you have songs by Elvis Presley, Santa Claus is Back in Town. It's, it's, like, it's a little blues rock song. Um, you know, Blue Christmas is one that everybody has heard before. But this one is great. Or you've got uh, the Marshall Tucker Band, Christmas in Carolina. Beautiful song. It's a kind of a shag tune, uh, shag dancing. I even say in the piece, you may end up shagging off, off this. But it's a, it's a, if you know that, I mean, know the shag, the dance, you, you could do that to this particular song. It's, it's fantastic. Or Charlie Daniels in 1990, he reduced this, uh, an album, Christmas Time Down South. Just a great tune. Charlie Daniels, the great bard from North Carolina, died a couple of years ago now. Um, you know, he's missed tremendously in his voice in Southern music, but certainly uh, fantastic. Alabama's Christmas Time and or Christmas in Dixie, um, just a great song uh, by, of course, one of the main you know, lead members of Alabama. Just died this past year, this year, and uh, so you know Alabama, the band has been uh, transformed a little bit, but. Um, a great soon, a great tune to say the least. Dolly Parton and, and Kenny Rogers, a Christmas to remember. These are some of the songs. Leonard Skinner has her own song, Christmas Time Again, um, produced in the early 2000s. Johnny Cash, that Christmassy feeling. These are all tunes written and performed by Southerners. Uh, Merle Haggard, Going Home for Christmas, and Dwight Yoakam, Come on Christmas. Um, Faith Hill, Where Are You Christmas? Faith Hill from Mississippi. Willie Nelson, Pretty Paper, a little song you wrote in the 1960s. Uh, about a you know, homeless man uh, trying to sell wrapping paper at Christmas. So George Strait, Christmas Cookies, which is a fun little kind of uh, rockabilly tune. It, t it takes you back to that, if you've ever heard it before, um, that's what I like about the South. It really has that feel to it, um, that Texas kind of rockabilly feel. And, of course, Roger Miller, Little Christmas, to uh, Little Tra Toy Trains, excuse me, real good classic Christmas song. Amy Grant, Tennessee Christmas, and Alan Jackson, Let It Be Christmas, and Finally, Brenda Lee, that this time of year, Brenda Lee, of course, had many Christmas hits before she was 18. Uh, but this was a 1964 tune and a tremendous song, too. So lots of great stuff that you can find to add to your Christmas list, your playlist on you know Spotify, Amazon, wherever you play your music, that you can add to it. Just take these songs, throw them in there. Of course, it's other things like Harry Connick. You still got the jazz tunes. Harry Connick wrote a couple of little... Uh, interesting songs, you know, jazz tunes that are unique. Uh, and of course, he is from uh, from the South, and so you have a lot of that, right? And we need to recognize that Southerners had a an, uh, an oversized influence on Christmas. And the piece by Jack Marcourt on Friday, the last piece of the year, December sixteenth, Christmas of Southern Tradition, gets into that. How uh, that really was a Southern holiday more than anything else. In fact, Southerners were calling it a state holiday long before New England and the North even got on board. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's fun. He talks about William Gilmore Sims and his couple of you know, Christmas tales. But uh, this, is, this is an important part of the Southern tradition and holidays and culture and how we think of things as American really were in many ways uh, part of that Southern tradition. And if you remove that Southern tradition from society, you remove part of America from society. And that's the real tragedy of all the things that are going on in America in 2022 and moving into 2023. They simply want to bulldoze a major part of American history. And that's more of an indictment on them than it is on this part of American history or the South. And it's also why we continue to do what we do at the Institute. So I want to say to everybody, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we're going to be back fully charged, ready to go in 2023. And we want you to be part of that with us. We've got a lot of good things coming. We're going to try to change the narrative on some things as best we can. But that comes back to you 
and how you can support us. Even if it's non-financial, you just want to share material, material around, you want to influence people, get people reading our stuff, letting people know what we do, and supporting us that way. Whatever you can do to support the Institute, whether it's financial or otherwise, we appreciate all of your support and all of your contributions. Have a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year, and we'll see you in 2023.